Good morning. We are in week five of a series that we're calling Who Am I? It's the idea of embracing who God has created us to be. And we've been looking a lot at what the world says versus what the Bible says, what the things of this world do to identify us and what God says to identify us. This past summer, as with every summer, we have this week here in town called Car Week. And one of the big things about that week is the auctions that take place. Now, I got to be honest with you. I'm not a car guy at all. I mean, I have a car. I have, a, I have several cars. I've got a 1965 Mustang, as a matter of fact, that is really close to being fixed up. I'm very excited about that. But it's just my personal vehicle that means something to me. But generally, as I look at cars and I see what's going on here at Car Week, I don't really pay much attention to it. But the last few years, my son has had the opportunity to volunteer at one of the auctions. And in volunteering, what he does is he pushes the cars out onto the stage before they um, get auctioned off. And so I tune in online because I can see my son pushing these very valuable cars out on the stage. Well, this last year in August, one car in particular caught my eye. It was, it fascinated me. I, it, was, it was set to auction off for somewhere between $1.2 and $1.6 million dollars. Now, we know about expensive things around here. We live in California. We live in Monterey. $1.2 to $1.6 million would get us a, a fairly nice house in this area. But to think of a car that sells for that is just remarkable. And this car ended up going higher and higher and higher. It bid for just under $1.9 million is what it sold for. You got to check it out because it's the most amazing thing ever. No joke, 1954 Ferrari Mundial 500, $1.875 million. Now, most of us would see that in a scrapyard and go, that thing is worthless. But there was a bidding war on this piece of scrap metal. Because you see, some people define this as highly valuable. Others define it as not valuable as all, just a pile of scrap. As we go through our lives, as we look at our identities, if we base our value on what other people say, we're going to get something here and something there that's going to be completely different. We're going to have some people saying it's high value and some people saying it's low value. Just like this car now, with this car, what's, what really matters is what people would pay for it. That's truly what the value is. And we look at our lives. We look at what God has paid. Our value will be a lot different. We'll be looking at our identity for the last four weeks. And, and we've looked at several different things. We've, we've talked about how we are a child of God, not a product of our family. And it's an important thing for us to understand, again, in our identity, a lot of people might define who we are based upon where we come from, depending on who our family is, depending on what our legacy is. But God says, no, you're different. You should be defined because you are my child. Many people find their identity in their political beliefs, that, that how they affiliate, what they see about the way things go in politics is really about their identity. And God says, no, you're a member of God's kingdom and that is where your identity lies. So many people find their identity in their past mistakes. They don't think about the fact that God has something new for them, some future glory for them. And their identity is in the mistakes that they made long ago or maybe even the mistakes that they made this morning. And last week, Pastor Kevin talked about how people find their identity often in their calling. And their calling in this world. But that we should be focused more on our calling from above. That God has gifted us and that he wants to use us to, to do his work in this world. And that's where identity should lie. When we use the word identity, it's important to note that everyone has an identity. 
whether we're aware of it or not, we develop it. And our identity is the filter with which we look at ourselves and look at the world around us. And all of us get programmed with this identity, most of us from a very early age. Often for us, I think, as we pursue the Christian faith, the the first part is kind of to do a little bit of deprogramming, of of undoing some of what our identity has been. And for others, it's easy to just embrace this idea and move forward. Like I said, the world has a lot of things to say about us. But really where we need to look is into God's word. We need to look at what God says to us and and look at the, the biblical understanding of who we are. And when we look at what God says to us through his word, we will absolutely be blessed. In Genesis 1, 27, we read, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You are made in the image of God. Just like that Ferrari was made out of a mold of the different pieces, the mold that made you is the mold that is the image of God. I don't know how many times I have read this passage and kind of passed right over it, not really spend a whole lot of time processing that. I think if we can really embrace the idea that we were made in the image of God, I think that redefines how we see ourselves, that redefines how we look at this world, that you were created in the image of God, isn't something small, isn't something to pass right by, isn't something to just move on from. To be made in the image of God is to be made in the image of the perfect creator. That's incredible. If that can be the identity that we embrace, it changes everything about us. Isaiah 43, 4 says, Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Often when we look at the Bible, when we read God's word, we've got to understand that sometimes God is speaking to a specific person at a specific time or a specific grouping of people based upon the situation that's going on in in their life. And here in this, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, specifically to his chosen people. But the truths that he is speaking apply to us today because you see, we as well are God's chosen people. God said through Isaiah that you are precious and that you are honored and that you are loved. Today, please hear this. You are precious to God. You are honored by God and you are loved by God. We fast forward to the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. When you give your life to Jesus, when you accept the gift that God freely gives you of Jesus' death and resurrection as a payment for your sins, you are God's chosen people, which means that you are precious and honored and loved. Psalm 139, 14 reads, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I love this passage. I'm not much for poetry, but I love this picture of God wonderfully making me and making you. You are wonderfully made. And just as we are created in God's image and just as we are precious and honored and loved, when we embrace the idea that you're wonderfully made, it changes things. It redefines how we live our lives. 
I think it's easy to sing a song on a Sunday morning that says I'm wonderfully made. I think it's easy to read Psalm 139 and say, okay, I'm wonderfully made. But I think that's just a start. Because I think for many of us, we need more than just the objective biblical truth. I think people need immersion in the truth to so slowly and fully absorb it. Do you live your lives like you are wonderfully made? Do you go through your life with this understanding that you're special and that you're precious? In, in my years of parenting and coaching, I can't count the amount of times that I've given a compliment, I've said something nice about one of my children or one of my players, and they say, hey, you're supposed to say that. You're my dad. Yeah, that's what coaches do. They say, good job. We lost the game, and you said, good job, so there's no good job there. I think so often in our lives, we read this and go, you are wonderfully made, and you go, yeah, 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 God's supposed to say that. He's supposed to tell us that. But it doesn't really mean anything but it needs to. We need to rest in this. We need to embrace this. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. This verse is often used to say, hey, we we got work to do, that God has a project for us. God has set things up and he wants us to be his hands and his feet in this world. And it's true. It's true. But I want to focus on one word today. And it's handiwork. Some versions say creation. Others say workmanship. And others say the word that really hits me. Masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. Masterpiece is... An interesting word. I did some research and found lots of masterpieces out in this world. And the one that rises above them all, that's looked at as the masterpiece of masterpieces, is the Mona Lisa. It's a painting. 10 million people a year travel the world to go visit it in the Louvre in Paris. To, to get a glimpse of this painting that they don't even get up and close and personal with. Millions of people come because that is a masterpiece. You got to hear this. The Mona Lisa pales in comparison to you. The Mona Lisa, hey, go ahead, clap. You are a far greater masterpiece than the Mona Lisa, than anything that any painter or sculptor or architect has ever put together. I think we often deny that, though. We look at our faults. We look at our flaws. We look at the things that aren't quite right with us, and we say, I'm not a masterpiece. I truly believe that when we do that, we deny that God is the master artist. When we say we are not a masterpiece, we're calling God a liar. We're saying, yeah, you say that, but I know. I know my faults. I know my flaws. It is an interesting thing as we, I was thinking of just those things in this world that we say are masterpieces. If we look at like the, the great Roman Colosseum, if we go and visit that thing, we're like, this is amazing. It's fallen apart. It's all in rubble, but it's still amazing. We could look at one of Michelangelo's great sculptures and it has cracks in it or chipped off things and we don't go, oh, that's miserable. Can't believe the finger's missing. We don't take away from the value because of those flaws, because of the wrinkles, because of the bald head. Like, it doesn't change our value. You are God's masterpiece. When we look at what the world says about us and not what God says about us, we get the wrong picture. You see, what the world says is confused, and it's corrupted. 
The world says that my value is determined by the number of Instagram followers I have. And if you don't do Instagram, then the number of Facebook friends you have. And if you don't do Facebook, then the number of people that know you when you go into Costco, whatever it may be, the world says that's your value. How you're known, how popular you are, how how much people notice you or recognize you. The world says that our, our value is determined by our looks, whether it be our height, our hair, or, or something else, maybe the way we dress, that's how the world gives value. The world says my value is determined by my job, how successful I am, how well I do in it, whether it's a job that's coveted. The world says that my value is determined by my bank account. Last week, Pastor Kevin said that your worth is not determined by your net worth. But the world says your value is determined by your bank account. The world says my value is determined by dot, 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 fill in the blank. We could rattle off a list all day long of how the world determines our value. But I really think that when we look at ourselves, when we look at God's God's way of valuing us. We should ask the question, how should I view myself? And then subsequently, how should I view others? I think we go back to the beginning of what I shared at the top of this message, that you are made in the image of God. You are precious. You are honored. You are loved. You are wonderfully made. You are God's masterpiece. Can you think of yourself that way? You are God's masterpiece. As children of God, as those created in his image, as God's masterpiece, our value is not determined by this world. And as we look at other people, we need to understand and embrace that their value is not determined by this world either. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. When we look at what has happened those last four weeks as we've been looking at our identity, we've got to understand that we make mistakes. We we understand that we get some wrinkles and we lose our hair and things happen. But for those who are in Christ, those who have come to the cross, who have said, I surrender my life to Jesus. You, you are a new creation. Think back to that car, that 1954 Ferrari Mondial 500, and it will take a lot for that car to be a new creation. For for us as children of God, God does it immediately. I want to show you a picture of what one of those cars can look like if it's been updated. That right there is what that car could look like. And who knows if it ever will. It may or may not be restored to that. They say it would take two to three million dollars to get it to that level of car on top of the nearly two million that was already spent. And for the owner, it may be worth it. And for God to restore you, to make a new creation, it was absolutely worth it. So I think as we look at this new perspective, it should change our pathway. It should change the way we move forward. It should change the way we live our lives. So said that this world often defines us by our look, often by the, the clothes that we wear. God has a new wardrobe for us, a new fit for us to put on. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, we read, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. 
people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I'm going to kind of combine some metaphors here and some things that don't seem to work together, and it's kind of odd because I'm telling you that God looks at the heart, but so often what's on the, in the heart can be reflected on the outside. So often what we have going on inside of us will show on the outside of us. I want to look at Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, and it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and bear with each other, And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds us, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Uh, I love this idea of clothing ourselves, of, of putting things on the outside. What I think is so great about this picture is that that is what people will see we clothe ourselves with compassion, meaning that is the thing that people can see in us. Compassion. Jesus, a great verse that describes Jesus' his compassion was found in Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We were to have that heart to care for and to sympathize for those who are hurting, those people in this world who are going without. They can go without financially. They can go without emotionally. They can be going without if they don't know Jesus. To clothe ourselves with compassion is to look through God's eyes at the people that he puts in our path. It's to look at them with soft hearts. It's to look at them with an understanding that they have needs. We're to clothe ourselves with kindness. And kindness is not just being nice and saying nice things. It's, it's more than that. Theologian William Barclay wrote in his commentary on Colossians that ancient Greeks defined kindness as the virtue of the man whose neighbor's good is as dear to him as his own. What William Barclay said was that the ancient Greeks said, kindness means I care about how things go for other people as much as I care about how they go for me. And we are to clothe ourselves with that. Romans 12, 10 says that we are to honor others above ourselves. To clothe ourselves with kindness is to elevate others, is to look out for their needs and seek to meet them. We are to clothe ourselves with humility. Paul writes in Romans 12, 3, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. To clothe ourselves with humility is to leave our house in the morning or interact with our family or whatever else happens within our day with an understanding that although I'm wonderfully made, everybody else in my world is wonderfully made. That I'm not better than them, that I don't deserve my way more than them, but that I should, again, humbly seek to meet their needs. We're to clothe ourselves with gentleness. This is a hard one for me. Gentleness is really restrained behavior. It's not a lack of power. It's not a lack of strength. It's not a lack of authority. It's the way you go about it. We are to go through our lives gentle. Jesus was gentle. Jesus, God in human flesh, creator of all, walked this world gently. He interacted with people gently. 
We just heard the story of the the woman, Samaritan woman at the well, and Jesus sat down with her. And he didn't bash her. He didn't berate her. He didn't beat her down. He approached her with gentleness. He approached her with the truth. He told her to live her life differently. But he did it gently. We're to clothe ourselves with patience. And this is a hard one in our world today. We want things now. We've kind of built that in. One of my favorite things to eat is uh, potatoes. I love potatoes. I eat potatoes almost every day. I'm not too picky about my potatoes either. Um, I throw them in the microwave to to bake them. And I got to tell you, I throw my potatoes in the microwave to cook them. And it takes 12-ish minutes. And I'm watching my clock the whole time. And I can't believe it takes me so long to cook these potatoes. Not too long ago, I wouldn't have had a microwave, right? I'd had to put them in my oven, and it would have taken half an hour just to get up to the temperature, and then another 45 minutes to an hour to get there. Yet I'm impatient at 12 minutes. We wait in the line at a drive thru and we're like, I can't believe this is so slow. Or we're stuck in traffic, you know, that terrible Monterey traffic, you know. 15 minutes of traffic jam, and we grow impatient. I was at a stoplight the other day. I was a pedestrian at a stoplight. It took like 90 seconds for the light to change, and the guy and I were talking to each other like, man, this light's taking forever. A minute and a half of waiting, and I was like, ah, it's too much. Being patient with people is a hard thing for us to do as well, but that's what God is calling us to do to clothe ourselves with patience. And then Paul says at the end, and over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I think we often think of love as a warm, fuzzy feeling in our belly. And sometimes that can be the case. But I actually believe that love is more of an action. It's more of a a word that describes what we're doing. It's a decision that we make. In 1 Corinthians 13, we hear this passage a lot in weddings, but I think it's a great way for us to wrap up today. And understanding that as we look at the clothing we put on, our compassion and our kindness and our humility and our gentleness and our patience, over all of that, we put on love. And Paul describes love this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. As we live our lives in our identity, understanding that we are God's creation, made in his image, that we're precious, that we're honored, and that we're loved, that we are God's masterpiece, clothed in compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And over all of that, we put on love, as Paul defines here. Our lives will be changed. The lives of those around us will be changed. Those who don't know Jesus will get a glimpse of what is possible with a relationship with him. This world will be different It's important for us to look at ourselves as God's wonderful creation, as his masterpiece. But it's also important to look at others that way, to not see their flaws and their faults and their shortcomings, but to see them as God's masterpiece too. When we do that, this world's a different place. Our families are different. Our schools are different. Our workplaces are different. 
our society as a whole will be different if God's people would do this. That's my challenge to you today. Seek each day to live your lives this way, to put on the the new wardrobe that God has given you and just see what God will do in you and through you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that for those who put their faith in you, they are a new creation. That the old is gone and the new has come. The new, a life that is capable of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and love. I ask that you would use each of us to be your light in this world. That by the way we treat one another, eyes and hearts and lives will be turned to you. That we can be used to bring light into this dark world. That we can see more and more lives changed for all eternity because of our obedience to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful message. What a beautiful message. We got some things going on here at Shoreline that are way cool. First this week is night of worship on Wednesday night. If you were here last night of worship, you know how deep and rich and wonderful it was. Don't miss it. It's this Wednesday night. The music kicks off at 6.15, so get here in time to park and join us for night of worship. And then Saturday... There's a men's breakfast from 8 to 10 here at Shoreline. And guys, it's going to be a great morning. You got to come. So build those things into your calendar. And now, uh, if you're new here, or even if you just have more questions, we have a connection center right across the lobby. Go over there and ask any question you want. If you're brand new, we have a special gift for you just to welcome you. And then if you're online, we have a digital connection card this number right here. So take advantage of that as well. And then lastly, I wanna let you know that we, um, we come up front and pray for people. And if there's something on your heart, in your life, on your mind, that it would be really good to have someone pray with you for that, these people are up here because they want to be. So if that's working for you and don't hesitate, come on forward. And now, If you're able to stand, I want to send you off with a blessing. Pastor Keith spoke the truth today. You are a masterpiece. The Lord adores you and delights in you. You are precious in his sight. You may not feel like it, but you are. It's like being six foot. If you say, well, I don't feel like it, therefore I'm not. That would sound ridiculous. So even if you don't feel like this is true about you. Guess what it is? It's absolutely true. So go out today knowing the truth and live your life the rest of this day as this reality is true in you. Jesus lives in you and that's who you are and then wake up and do it all over again tomorrow. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.